Hello and welcome to this review on options. An option is a two-party contract. It is a contract between a buyer and a seller. Let's take a look at the role of the buyer and seller in any given option contract. The buyer is said to be the owner, the holder, or is said to be long the contract. The seller is also known as the writer or said to be short the contract. The buyer of the contract pays a premium to the seller and acquires a right. The seller receives the premium and because they receive the premium, they take on an obligation. So a buyer of an option contract has a right and the seller of an option contract has an obligation. The buyer of the contract wants to exercise their right under the contract and the seller of the contract wants their obligation to expire. Let me see if I can put a little bit of an example to this for you that will help you understand this a little bit more clearly. Most of us have cars and we're concerned that our car may be involved in an accident and would have to be repaired. So what do we do when we have a car? We buy car insurance and we pay a premium for that car insurance. Maybe we pay it quarterly or monthly or semi-annually and the insurance company takes that premium from you. So you are paying your car insurance premium to the car insurance company. Because you paid the premium, should your car be involved in an accident, you have the right to call up your car insurance company and say, hey, please fix my car, I was just rear-ended. Now, the insurance company, because they took your car insurance premium, is obligated to fix it. And this is exactly how a contract for an option works between the buyer and a seller. The buyer has a right under the contract. The seller takes on an obligation under the contract. The buyer pays a premium to the seller. Now let's take a look at the two types of options that could be involved in an option contract. There are two types, calls and puts. The buyer of a call has a right to buy the stock at a set price. They want the stock to go up. They are said to be bullish on that stock. The seller of a call is obligated to sell the stock at a fixed price. They want the stock to go down. They are said to be bearish on that stock. The buyer of a put has a right to sell the stock. They are bearish on the stock. They want the stock to go down. The seller of a put takes on an obligation to buy the stock. They are bullish on the stock. They want the stock to go up. The term bullish and bearish originated from the way the animal strikes. A bull will lower its head and raise its horns up on you. A bear will swat you down with its paw. So that's the origin of the term. If the test asks you which two people are bullish on the stock, well, a call buyer is, has the right to buy the stock and a put seller is, has an obligation to buy the stock. So the bulls buy the stock, those are the two parties that would be bullish on the underlying stock. Now let's take a look at a little bit of an example here and we will go through each component of a potential option trade. So here on your screen we have a nice example. Someone bought one XYZ June 50 call at 7. So the buyer of this call contract has the right to buy 100 shares of XYZ at $50 until June. And for this right, they paid a premium of seven or $7 per share. They paid a total premium of $700. Every option contract covers 100 shares of stock. So here we've locked in the right to buy 100 shares of XYZ at $50 per share until June. 
So let's take a look at our max gain, our max loss, and our break even. Well, when you buy a stock, what is your maximum gain? Well, when you buy a stock, there's no limit to how high that stock price can go. It could go to a million or infinity and beyond. So the, your maximum gain is unlimited. When you buy a call, it gives you the right to buy a stock at a set price. And once again, there is no limit to how high that stock can go. So when you bought a call or you are said to be long a call, your maximum gain remains unlimited. Now, when you buy an option, your maximum loss is always the premium you paid. So here we bought one XYZ June 50 call at $7 per share, a premium of $7 per share, a total premium of $700 for the contract. We can't lose any more than $700. So that is indeed our maximum loss. Where would XYZ have to be at expiration in June for us to break even? To determine our break even on a call, it is the strike price plus the premium. The strike price is $50. We have the right to buy the stock at 50. But for that right, we paid a premium of $7 per share. So we would break even at $57. If XYZ was $57 at expiration on, in June, we would break even. For every penny over that, we would make money. And for any penny lower than that, we would lose money up until our maximum amount of $7 per share or $700 for the whole contract. So here we have someone who bought a call option and we can't have a buyer of a call option without a seller of a call option. So let's take a look at the seller of the contract in the same underlying stock. So here we're taking the other side of the trans transaction and we are selling one XYZ June 50 call at $7, a premium of $7 per share or $700 for the whole contract. Each contract represents 100 shares of stock or one round lot, as they say. So here, because we received the premium of $7 per share or of $700, that is our maximum gain. Whenever you sell an option contract, the premium you receive is the most you can ever earn or make on that trade. Now here, we took on the obligation to sell XYZ at $50 per share, and we sold that right to another party for $7. There is no limit to how high this stock can rise, so we have a theoretical maximum loss that is unlimited. We, XYZ could go to $700 or $800 or $900 a share, and we would be forced to go into the marketplace and buy it at perhaps $900 per share and deliver it to the call buyer at $50 a share, losing the difference. So our theoretical maximum loss is unlimited because there's no limit to how high XYZ can go. Now, where will we have to be at expiration to break even? Well, we use the same formula, strike price plus premium, $50 plus the $7 is a break even of $57. For every penny over 57, we begin to lose money. And for every penny under 57, we begin to make money. We can make a maximum of $7 per share or $700 for the whole contract. Now here you begin to see the relationship between the buyer and the seller. The buyer's maximum gain is the seller's maximum loss. The buyer's maximum loss is the seller's maximum gain, and they both break even at the same price. That is because one party is paying the premium to the other. They are exchanging the premiums, one, the buyer is acquiring the, a right, and the seller is taking on an obligation. Now let's take a look at how this transaction would come together if we left everything the same except now we change the type of option to a put. 
So we bought one XYZ June 50 put at seven. Here we have acquired the right to sell XYZ at $50 per share until the expiration in June. And for that right, we paid once again a premium of $7 per share or $700 for the entire contract. Whenever you buy an option, your maximum loss is always the premium you paid. So here, once again, we paid a premium of $7 per share or $700 for the whole contract. Therefore, our maximum loss is $700. Well, what is our maximum gain? Well, our maximum gain is not unlimited. Nothing is ever unlimited with a put because there is always zero. A stock may not fall below zero. It cannot go into negative numbers. So to determine your maximum gain, you must first determine your break even. Where would XYZ have to be at expiration for us to break even? To determine the break even on a put, it is strike price minus the premium. So here, once again, we have a $50 strike price minus that $7 premium. We would break even at $43 per share. 50 minus seven gives us a break even of $43. Now, we would make money from $43 all the way down to zero. XYZ could not go into negative territory. So our maximum gain on a put is our break even down to zero. In this case, it's $43 per share or $4,300 for the entire contract. Now, you can't have a buyer of a put if you don't have a seller of a put. So we're taking the other side now. We're selling one XYZ June 50 put at seven. Whenever you sell an option contract, the premium you received is your maximum gain. So here our maximum gain is $7 per share or $700 for the entire contract. Now, what is our maximum loss? If our premium is our maximum gain, we must have some way to figure out our maximum loss. Well, once again, nothing is unlimited with a put and to determine our maximum loss, we must first calculate our break even. To calculate the break even on a put contract, well, it is strike price minus the premium. And in our example here, once again, we get 50 minus seven, gives us a break even of 43. So at $43, we break even. However, we are short this contract, which means we want this contract to rise and the option to expire worthless. So our maximum loss would be our break even down to zero. Every penny below 43, we lose money. Every penny above 43, we make money up to the point of our entire premium of $7 per share or $700 for the entire contract. And once again, here in the put side of the equation, we see the relationship between the buyer and the seller. The buyer's maximum gain is the seller's maximum loss. The buyer's maximum loss is the seller's maximum gain. And they both break even at the same price. Now let's take a look at option values and how premiums are determined. And one of the most important factors in determining the value or premium of an option is the relationship of the option's strike price to the underlying stock price. And here we're going to visit three different concepts for puts and calls. And the first concept we want to talk about is an option that is in the money. A call option is in the money if the stock price is higher than the strike price of the option. And call option is in the money when the value of the stock exceeds the strike price of the option. The option therefore is said to be in the money. An option is at the money 
when the stock price equals the strike price. An option is at the money when the stock price equals the strike price. A call would be out of the money when the strike price of the option exceeds the price of the stock. So here you have three different terms. You have in the money, at the money, and out of the money. And it's very important for you to know that these terms do not refer to profitability in any way, shape, or form. They merely refer to a relationship between the strike price of the option and the price of the underlying stock. So here we've reviewed these three ter terms or three relationships for calls. Now let's take a look at these terms as they relate to a put contract. A put is in the money when the strike price is greater than the stock price. The strike price of the option exceeds the price of the stock. When this relationship is present, the put is said to be in the money. A put like a call will be at the money when the strike price of the put equals the price of the stock. And a put would be out of the money when the stock price is greater or higher than the strike price of the option. So a put is out of the money when the stock price is greater than the strike price of an option. It would never make sense to exercise an out of the money option. It would only make sense to exercise an in the money option. And now we're going to move forward and we're going to take a look at this concept a little bit more closely. An option that is in the money is said to have intrinsic value. Or saying it another way, an option's intrinsic value is the amount the option is in the money. An option's total premium is therefore determined by adding the intrinsic value, the in the money amount, to the time value of the option. The option's time value is what someone would pay for the option or for the opportunity to exercise that option somewhere down the road. The more time to expiration, the greater the time value. So for example, an option expiring from two weeks from now would have a lot less time value than an option expiring six months from now. So an option's total premium is its intrinsic value, it's in the money amount, plus its time value. Now let's take a look at a, a couple of examples and see if we can work through this a little bit together. Here we have an XYZ April 50 call and it's trading at a premium of $3.20. And XYZ is trading in the marketplace at 51. Is this option in the money or is it out of the money? Well, the strike price on the option is $50 and the stock is trading at 51. We said a call option is in the money when the stock price is higher than the strike price. Clearly 51 is higher than 50, so we have an option here that is in the money and it has intrinsic value of $1. That's the amount by which the stock price is greater than the strike price of the call option. Well, the intrinsic value is $1. Therefore, the rest of that premium of $3.20 must be time value. That is the price we would pay for the opportunity to exercise the option down the road. So our time value here is $2.20. $1 of intrinsic value and $2.20 in time value. Take a look at another example. Here again we have the same April 50 call. This time it's trading at a premium of $1.20 and XYZ is at $49 per share. 
Is this option in the money or out of the money? That's right, it's out of the money because the strike price of the option exceeds the price of the stock. It would not make sense for us to exercise our right to buy the stock at 50 when it's trading in the marketplace at 49. Therefore, this option is out of the money, it has zero intrinsic value, and the entire premium of $1.20, therefore, is time value. Now, let's take a look at how things to come together on the put side of the equation. So here we're working with an XYZ April 50 put. It's trading in the marketplace at a premium of $1.40, and XYZ is at $49 per share. Well, is this put in the money or out of the money? Well, we said that a put contract is in the money when the strike price of the option exceeds the price of the stock. $50 strike price is greater than the $49 stock price, so we have a contract that is in the money. The intrinsic value, therefore, is $1. And the remaining premium of the option, 40 cents in this case, is time value. Remember, time value is the amount we pay for the right to exercise the option. Perhaps this option only expires a few days from now, therefore the amount of the time value is very low. So intrinsic value plus time value equals our total premium, a dollar of intrinsic value and 40 cents of time value gives us that total premium of $1.40. Now let's take a look at another scenario with our put contract. Again, we have the XYZ April 50 put trading at a premium of 70 cents and XYZ is at $50 and 75 cents. Is this contract in the money or out of the money? Well, we said that a put contract is out of the money when the stock price is greater than the strike price of the option. $50.75 is indeed higher than the strike price of 50, so this option is out of the money, it has no intrinsic value, therefore the entire premium is made up of time value, and it is 70 cents. The entire premium is time value, this option is out of the money. I think we just did a really great review of the basics of options for your exam. We'd like you to review this material more closely in your text and to take some option questions in your test banks. We'll see you in the next section.